you guys. It's Mrs. Yeagle, and I'm going to read to you chapter 13 of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, because if we were in school right now, we would be trying really, really hard to finish this book before spring break started. And uh, I guess the downside is that right now uh, it's Thursday, and so we have tomorrow and then spring break. But I don't mind going live like every afternoon to read you another chapter or two so we can finish it because um, you can't stop a book halfway through. Right. So if you have a copy of this book at home, I'm on page 252. And if you don't and you just listen, that's totally fine. So chapter 13 is called Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw. It looked like the end of Ron and Hermione's friendship. Each was so angry with the other that Harry couldn't see how they'd ever make up. Ron was enraged that Hermione had never taken Crookshanks' attempts to eat Scabbers seriously, hadn't bothered to keep a close enough watch on him, and was still trying to pretend that Crookshanks was innocent by suggesting that Ron look for Scabbers underneath all the boys' beds. Hermione, meanwhile, maintained fiercely that Ron had no proof that Crookshanks had eaten Scabbers, that the ginger hairs might have been there since Christmas, and that Ron had been prejudiced against her cat ever since Crookshanks had landed on Ron's head in the magical menagerie. Personally, Harry was sure that Crookshanks had eaten Scabbers, and when he tried to point out to Hermione that the evidence all pointed that way, she lost her temper with Harry, too. Okay, Side with Ron, I knew you would, she said shrilly. First the firebolt, now scabbers. Everything is my fault, isn't it? Just leave me alone, Harry. I've got a lot of work to do. Ron had taken the loss of his rat very hard indeed. Come on, Ron, you were always saying how boring scabbers was, said Fred bracingly. And he's been off color for ages. He was wasting away. It's probably better for him to snuff it quickly. One swallow probably didn't even feel a thing. Fred, said Ginny indignantly. All he did was eat and sleep, Ron. You said it yourself, said George. He bit Goyle for us once, said Ron miserably. Remember, Harry? Yeah, that's true, said Harry. His finest hour, said Fred, unable to keep a straight face. Let the scar on Goyle's finger stand as a lasting tribute to his memory. Oh, come on, Ron, get yourself down to Hogsmeade and buy a new rat. What's the point of moaning? In a last ditch attempt to cheer Ron up, Harry persuaded him to come along to the Gryffindor team's final practice before the Ravenclaw match so he could have a ride on the Firebolt after they'd finished. This did seem to take Ron's mind off Scabbers for the moment. Great. Can I try and few to shoot, shoot a few goals on it? So they set off for the Quidditch field together. Madam Hooch, who was still overseeing Gryffindor practices to keep an eye on Harry, was just as impressed with the firebolt as everyone else had been. She took it in her hands before takeoff and gave them the benefit of her professional opinion. Look at the balance on it. If the Nimbus series has a fault, it's a slight tilt to the tail end. You often find they develop a drag after a few years. They've updated the handle, too. A bit slimmer than the clean sweeps. Reminds me of the old silver arrows. A pity they've stopped making them. I learned a fly on one, and a very fine old broom it was, too. She continued in this vein for some time until Wood said, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Madam Hooch, is it okay if Harry has the fireboat back? He needs to practice. Oh, right. Here you are, then, Potter, said Madam Hooch. I'll sit over here with Weasley. She and Ron left the field to sit in the stadium and the Gryffindor team gathered around Wood for his final instructions for tomorrow's match. Harry, I've just found out who Ravenclaw's playing a seeker. It's Cho Chang. She's a fourth year and she's pretty good. I really hoped she wouldn't be fit. She's had some problems with injuries. Wood scowled his displeasure that Cho Chang had made a full recovery and then said, on the other hand, she rides a Comet 260, which is going to look like a joke next to that fireboat. He gave Harry's broom a look of fervent admiration and then said, All right, everyone, let's go. And at long last, Harry mounted his firebolt and kicked off from the ground. It was better than ever dreamed. The firebolt turned with the lightest touch. It seemed to obey his thoughts rather than his grip. It sped across the field at such speed that the stadium turned into a green and gray blur. Harry turned it so sharply that Alicia Spinett screamed. Then he went into a perfectly controlled dive, brushing the grassy field with his toes before rising 30, 40, 50 feet into the air again. Harry, 
I'm letting the snitch out, Wood called. Harry turned and raised a bludger toward the goalposts. He outstripped it easily, saw the snitch dart out from behind Wood, and within 10 seconds had caught it tightly in his hand. The team cheered madly. Harry let the snitch go again, gave it a minute's head start, then tore after it, weaving in and out of the others. He spotted it lurking near Katie Bell's knee, looped her easily, and caught it again. It was the best practice ever. The team, inspired by the presence of the firebolt in their midst, performed their best moves faultlessly. And by the time they hit the ground again, Wood didn't have a single criticism to make, which, as George Weasley pointed out, was a first. I can't see what's going to stop us tomorrow, said Wood. Well, not unless, Harry, you've sorted out your Dementor problem, haven't you? Yeah, said Harry, thinking of his feeble Patronus and wishing it were stronger. The Dementors won't turn up again, Oliver. Dumbledore would go ballistic, said Fred confidently. Well, let's hope not, said Wood. Anyway, good work, everyone. Let's get back to the tower. Turn in early. I'm staying out for a bit. Ron wants to go on the firebolt, Harry told Wood. And while the rest of the team headed off to the locker rooms, Harry strode over to Ron, who vaulted the barrier to the stands and came to meet him. Madam Hooch had fallen asleep in her seat. Here you go, said Harry, handing Ron the firebolt. Ron, an expression of ecstasy on his face, mounted the broom and zoomed off into the gathering darkness, while Harry walked around the edge of the field watching him. Night had fallen before Madam Hooch awoke with a start, told Harry and Ron off for not waking her, and insisted they go back to the castle. Harry shouldered the firebolt, and he and Ron walked out of the shadowy stadium, discussing the firebolt's superbly smooth action, its phenomenal acceleration, and its pinpoint turning. They were halfway toward the castle when Harry, glancing to his left, saw something that made his heart turn over, a pair of eyes gleaming out of the darkness. Harry stopped dead, his heart banging against his ribs. What's the matter? said Ron. Harry pointed. Ron pulled out his wand and muttered, Lumos. A beam of light fell across the grass, hit the bottom of a tree, and illuminated its branches. There, crouching among the budding leaves, was Crookshanks. Get out of here! Ron roared, and he stopped, stooped down and seized a stone lying on the grass. But before he could do anything else, Crookshanks had vanished with one swish of his long ginger tail. See, said Ron furiously, chucking the stone down again. She's still letting him wander about wherever he wants, probably washing down scabbers with a couple of birds now. Harry didn't say anything. He took a deep breath as relief seeped through him. He'd been sure for a moment that those eyes had belonged to the Grimm. They set off for the castle once more. Slightly ashamed of his moment of panic, Harry didn't say anything to Ron nor did he look left or right until they'd reached the well-lit entrance hall. Harry found a breakfast the next morning with the rest of the boys in his dormitory, all of whom seemed to think the firebolt deserved a sort of guard of honor. As Harry entered the great hall, heads turned in the direction of the firebolt, and there was a good deal of excited muttering. Harry saw with enormous satisfaction that the Slytherin team were all looking thunderstruck. Did you see his face? said Ron gleefully, looking back at Malfoy. He can't believe it! This is brilliant! Wood, too, was basking in the reflected glory of the firebolt. Put it here, Harry, he said, laying the broom in the middle of the table and carefully turning it so his name faced upward. People from Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff tables were soon coming over to look. Cedric Diggory came over to congratulate Harry on having acquired such a superb replacement for his Nimbus, and Percy's Ravenclaw girlfriend, Penelope Clearwater, asked if she could actually hold the firebolt. Now, now, Penny, no sabotage, said Percy heartily as she examined the firebolt closely. Penelope and I have a bet on, he told the team. Ten galleons on the outcome of the match. Penelope put the firebolt down again, thanked Harry, and went back to her table. Harry, make sure you win, said Percy in an urgent whisper. I haven't got ten galleons. Yes, I'm coming, Penny. And he bustled off to join her in a piece of toast. Charlie Yeagle is here. What do you need? I just want to do. Okay. Hi. And I kind of want to listen. All right. You can listen. Like Harry Potter. Okay. Sure you can manage that broom, Potter, said a cold, drawling voice. Who is it? Malfoy. It's Malfoy. Draco Malfoy had arrived for a closer look. Crab and Goyle right behind him. Yeah, I reckon so, said Harry casually. 
Got plenty of special features, hasn't it? Said Malfoy, eyes glittering maliciously. Shame it doesn't come with a parachute. In case you get too near a Dementor, Crab and Goyle sniggered. Pity you can't attach an extra arm to yours, Malfoy, said Harry. Then it could catch the snitch for you. The Gryffindor team laughed loudly. Malfoy's pale eyes narrowed and he stalked away. They watched him rejoin the rest of the Slytherin team, who put their heads together, no doubt asking Malfoy whether Harry's broom really was a firebolt. At a quarter to eleven, the Gryffindor team set off for the locker rooms. The weather couldn't have been more different from their match against Hufflepuff. It was a clear, cool day with a very light breeze. There'd be no visibility problems today, and Harry, though nervous, was starting to feel the excitement only a Quidditch match could bring. They could hear the rest of the school moving into the stadium beyond. Harry took off his black school robes, removed his wand from his pocket, and stuck it inside the t-shirt he was going to wear under his Quidditch robes. He only hoped he wouldn't need it. He wondered suddenly whether Professor Lupin was in the crowd watching. You know what we've got to do, said Wood as they prepared to leave the locker rooms. If we lose this match, we're out of the running. Just, just fly like you did at practice yesterday and we'll be okay. They walked out onto the field to tumultuous applause. The Ravenclaw team, dressed in blue, were already standing in the middle of the field. Their seeker, Cho Chang, was the only girl on their team. She was shorter than Harry by about a head, and Harry couldn't help noticing, nervous as he was, that she was extremely pretty. She smiled at Harry as the teams faced each other behind their captains, and he felt a slight lurch in the region of his stomach that he didn't think had anything to do with nerves. Wood, Davies, shake hands, Madam Hooch said briskly, and Wood shook hands with the Ravenclaw captain. Match your brooms on my whistle, three, two, one. Harry kicked off into the air and the firebolt zoomed higher and faster than any other broom. He soared around the stadium and began squinting around for the snitch, listening all the while to the commentary, which was being provided by the Weasley twins' friend, Lee Jordan. They're off in the big excitement. This match is the firebolt that Harry Potter's flying for Gryffindor. According to which broomstick, the firebolt's going to be the broom of choice for the national teams at this year's World Championship. Jordan, would you mind telling us what's going on in the match? Interrupted Professor McGonagall's voice. Right, you are, Professor. <clears throat> Just... Giving a bit of background information, the firebolt, incidentally, has a built-in auto-break and... Jordan? Okay, okay, Gryffindor in possession, Katie Bell of Gryffindor heading for goal. Harry streaked past Katie in the opposite direction, gazing around for a glint of gold and noticing that Cho Chang was tailing him closely. She was undoubtedly a very good flyer. She kept cutting across him, forcing him to change direction. Show her your acceleration, Harry, Fred yelled as he whooshed past in pursuit of a bludger that was aiming for Alicia. Harry urged the firebolt forward as they rounded the Ravenclaw goalposts and Cho fell behind. Just as Katie succeeded in scoring the first match and the Gryffindor end of the field went wild, he saw it. The snitch was close to the ground, flitting near one of the barriers. Harry dived. Cho saw what he was doing and tore after him. Harry was speeding up, excitement flooding him. Dives were his specialty. He was 10 feet away. Then a bludger, hit by one of the Ravenclaw beaters, came pelting out of nowhere. Harry veered off course, avoiding it by an inch. And in those few crucial seconds, the snitch had vanished. There was a great, oh, of disappointment from the Gryffindor supporters, but much applause for their beater from the Ravenclaw end. George Weasley vented his feelings by hitting the second bludger directly at the offending beater, who was forced to roll right over in midair to avoid it. Gryffindor leads by 80 points to zero. And look at that fireball go. Potter's really putting it through its paces now. You see it turn. Chang's Comet is just no match for it. The fireball's precision balance is really noticeable in these long... Jordan? Are you being paid to advertise firebolts? Get on with the commentary! Ravenclaw was pulling back. They'd now scored three goals, which put Gryffindor only 50 points ahead. If Cho got the snitch before him, Ravenclaw would win. Harry dropped lower, narrowly avoiding a Ravenclaw chaser, scanning the field frantically. A glint of gold, a flutter of tiny wings. The snitch was circling the Gryffindor goalpost. Harry accelerated, eyes fixed on the speck of gold ahead, but just then Cho appeared out of thin air, blocking him. Harry, this is no time to be a gentleman, Wood roared as Harry swerved to avoid a collision. Knock her off her broom if you have to. 
Harry turned and caught sight of Cho. She was grinning. The snitch had vanished again. Harry turned his firebolt upward and was soon 20 feet above the game. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Cho following him. She decided to mark him rather than search for the snitch herself. All right, then. She wanted to tail him. She'd have to take the consequences. He dived again, and Cho, thinking he'd seen the snitch, tried to follow. Harry pulled out of the dive very sharply. She hurtled downward. He rose fast as a bullet once more and then saw it for the third time. The snitch was glittering way above the field at the Ravenclaw end. He accelerated so many feet below. So did Cho. He was winning, gaining on the snitch with every second. Then, oh, screamed Cho, pointing. Distracted, Harry looked down. Three Dementors, three tall, black, hooded Dementors were looking up at him. He didn't stop to think. Plunging a hand down the neck of his robes, he whipped out his wand and roared, Expecto Patronum! Something silver white, something enormous erupted from the end of his wand. He knew it had shot directly at the Dementors, but didn't pause to watch. His mind still miraculously clear, he looked ahead. He was nearly there. He stretched out the hand, still grasping his wand, and just managed to close his fingers over the small, struggling snitch. Madame Hooch's whistle sounded. Harry turned around in midair and saw six scarlet blurs bearing down on him. Next moment, the whole team was hugging him so hard he was nearly pulled off his broom. Down below, he could hear the roars of the Gryffindors in the crowd. That's my boy, Wood kept yelling. Alicia, Angelina, and Katie had all kissed Harry. Fred had him in a grip so tight, Harry felt as though his head would come off. In complete disarray, the team managed to make its way back to the ground. Harry got off his broom and looked up to see a gaggle of Gryffindor supporters sprinting onto the field, Ron in the lead. Before he knew it, he'd been engulfed by the cheering crowd. Yes! Ron yelled, yanking Harry's arm into the air. Yes! Yes! Well done, Harry, said Percy, looking delighted. Ten galleons to me. Must find Penelope, excuse me. Good for you, Harry, roared Seamus Finnegan. Ruddy, brilliant, boomed Hagrid over the heads of the milling Gryffindors. That was quite some Patronus, said a voice in Harry's ear. Harry turned around to see Professor Lupin, who looked both shaken and pleased. The Dementis didn't affect me at all, Harry said excitedly. I didn't feel a thing. That would be because they uh, <clears throat> weren't Dementis, said Professor Lupin. Come and see. He led Harry out of the crowd until they were able to see the edge of the field. You gave Mr. Malfoy quite a fright, said Lupin. Harry stared. Lying in a crumpled heap on the ground were Malfoy, Crabbe, Goyle, and Marcus Flint, the Slytherin team captain, all struggling to remove themselves from long black hooded robes. It looked as though Malfoy had been standing on Goyle's shoulders. Standing over them with an expression of the utmost fury on her face was Professor McGonagall. An unworthy trick, she was shouting. A low and cowardly attempt to sabotage the Gryffindor Seeker. Detention for all of you and 50 points from Slytherin. I shall be speaking to Professor Dumbledore about this. Make no mistake. Ah, oh, here he comes now. If anything could have set the seal on Gryffindor's victory, it was this. Ron, who had fought his way through to Harry's side, doubled up with laughter as they watched Malfoy fighting to extricate himself from the robe, Goyle's head still stuck inside of it. Come on, Harry, said George, fighting his way over. Party! Gryffindor common room, now! Right, said Harry, and feeling happier than he had in ages, he and the rest of the team led the way, still in their scarlet robes, out of the stadium and back up to the castle. It felt as though they had already won the Quidditch Cup. The party went on all day and well into the night. Fred and George Weasley disappeared for a couple of hours and returned with armfuls of bottles of butterbeer, pumpkin fizz, and several bags full of Honeyduke sweets. How did you do that? Squealed Angelina Johnson as George started throwing peppermint toads into the crowd. With a little help from Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, Fred muttered in Harry's ear. Only one person wasn't joining in the festivities. Hermione, incredibly, was sitting in a corner attempting to read an enormous book entitled Home Life and Social Habits of British Muggles. Harry broke away from the table where Fred and George had started juggling butterbeer bottles and went over to her. Did you even come to the match? He asked her. Of course I did, said Hermione in a strangely high-pitched voice, not looking up. 
and I'm very glad we won. And I think you did really well, but I need to read this by Monday. Come on, Hermione, come over and have some food, Harry said, looking over at Ron and wondering whether he was in a good enough mood to bury the hatchet. I can't, Harry. I've still got 422 pages to read, said Hermione, now sounding slightly hysterical. Anyway, she glanced over at Ron, too. He doesn't want me to join in. There was no arguing with this, as Ron chose that moment to say loudly, if Scabbers hadn't just been eaten, he could have had some of these fudge flies. He used to really like them. Hermione burst into tears. Before Harry could say or do anything, she tucked the enormous book under her arm and still sobbing, ran toward the staircase to the girls' dormitories and out of sight. Can't you give her a break? Harry asked Ron quietly. No, said Ron flatly. If she just acted like she was sorry, but she'll never admit she's wrong, Hermione, she's still acting like Scabbers has gone on vacation or something. The Gryffindor party ended only when Professor McGonagall turned up in her tartan dressing gown and hairnet at one in the morning to insist that they all go to bed. Harry and Ron climbed the stairs to their dormitory, still discussing the match. At last, exhausted, Harry climbed into bed, twitched the hangings of his four-poster shut to block out a ray of moonlight, lay back and felt himself almost instantly drifting off to sleep. He had a very strange dream. He was walking through a forest, his firebolt over his shoulder, following something silvery white. It was winding its way through the trees ahead and he could only catch glimpses of it between the leaves. Anxious to catch up with it, he sped up, but as he moved faster, so did his quarry. Harry broke into a run and ahead he heard hooves gathering speed. Now he was running flat out, and ahead he could hear galloping. Then he turned a corner into a clearing and, Oh, no! Harry woke as suddenly as though he'd been hit in the face. Disoriented in the total darkness, he fumbled with his hangings. He could hear movements around him and Seamus Finnegan's voice from the other, other side of the room. What's going on? Harry thought he heard the dormitory door slam. At last, finding the divide in his curtains, he ripped them back. And at the same moment, Dean Thomas lit his lamp. Ron was sitting up in bed, the hangings torn from one side, a look of utmost fear on his face. Black. Serious black. With a knife. What? Here, just now, slash the curtains woke me up. Are you sure you weren't dreaming, Ron? said Dean. Look at the curtains. I tell you he was here. They all scrambled out of bed. Harry reached the dormitory door first and they sprinted back down the staircase. Doors opened behind them and sleepy voices called after them. Who shouted? What are you doing? The common room was lit with the glow of the dying fire, still littered with debris from the party. It was deserted. Are you sure you weren't dreaming, Ron? I'm telling you, I saw him. What's all this noise? Professor McGonagall told us to go to bed. A few of the girls had come down their staircase, pulling on dressing gowns and yawning. Boys, too, were reappearing. Excellent. Are we carrying on? Said Fred Weasley brightly. Everyone back upstairs, said Percy, hurrying into the common room and pinning his head boy badge to his pajamas as he spoke. Purse, serious black, said Ron faintly. In our dormitory, with a knife, woke me up. The common room went very still. Nonsense, said Percy, looking startled. You had too much to eat, Ron. Had a nightmare. I'm telling you. Now, really, that's enough. Professor McGonagall was back. She slammed the portrait behind her as she entered the common room and stared furiously around. I am delighted that Gryffindor won the match, but this is getting ridiculous. Percy, I expected better of you. I certainly didn't authorize this, Professor, said Percy, puffing himself up indignantly. I was just telling them all to get back to bed. My brother Ron here had a nightmare. It wasn't a nightmare, Ron yelled. Professor, I woke up and Sirius Black was standing over me holding a knife. Professor McGonagall stared at him. Don't be ridiculous, Weasley. How could he possibly have gotten through the portrait hole? Ask him, said Ron, pointing a shaking finger at the back of Sir Cadigan's picture. Ask him if he saw... Glaring suspiciously at Ron, Professor McGonagall pushed the portrait back open and went outside. The whole common room listened with bated breath. Sir Cadigan, did you just let a man enter Gryffindor Tower? Certainly, good lady, cried Sir Cadigan.
there was a stunned silence, both inside and outside the common room. You, you did, said Professor McGonagall, but, but the password. He had them, said Sir Cadigan proudly. Had the whole weeks, my lady. Read them off a little piece of paper. Professor McGonagall pulled herself back through the portrait hole to face the stunned crowd. She was white as chalk. Which person, she said, her voice shaking, which abysmally foolish person wrote down this week's passwords and left them lying around? There was utter silence, broken by the smallest of terrified squeaks. Neville Longbottom, trembling from head to fluffy slippered toes, raised his hands slowly into the air. Poor old Neville. Poor Neville. <laughs> oh, guys, that's the end of chapter 13. So I'll be back tomorrow. Chapter or, uh, 14, yeah. Snape Scrudge and Snape looks ugly. Yep. To read chapter 14, like Charlie just said. Mm -hmm. So, all right. See you guys later. Bye. 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 Well, we made it to two minutes.